none, so that's how many years ago. Uh, she was my junior Sabbath school teacher, and it was a good class. I got a, a good blessing from that, and I remember that year very well. And the Lord was good. Well, let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to kneel as we pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this camp meeting and for what you are doing here. And we thank you for how your Holy Spirit is touching our hearts. And I just pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit again during this hour of worship. And I pray that the words that are spoken will be according to your will and that they will challenge us to come to a higher walk with you. I pray that this weekend would just, wouldn't just be another camp meeting, but that it would be a moment of life-changing opportunities that we take to come to a higher walk with Jesus. So I pray now that you would speak through me. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The title for this message is How Do We Bring Closure to Jesus? This morning we talked about why Jesus needs closure. We see that sin brings pain to the heart of God. But how is it that this world of sin and suffering will finally come to an end? You know, here we are in May, it's May 19, 2018. And I think it's fair to say that God never intended for us to be here this long. And how is it that this world of sin and suffering will be brought to a close? You know, I read a statement from Education, page 263 this morning, and I'm going to just repeat part of it as we continue in our message this morning, where Ellen White says the cross is a revelation to our dull senses of the pain that from its very inception sin has brought to the heart of God. When we see the agony that God, the Father, the Son, went through on the cross, it should melt our hearts with respect to the sin in our lives. And God had a purpose with what Jesus went through on the cross. And I want you to turn to John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. And we find that in the experience of the cross, God has a plan to bring an end to the sin and suffering in this world. John 12, verses 23 and 24. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Now obviously Jesus is speaking of his death. Jesus being glorified with his death on the cross. So the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So Jesus is saying, the hour is coming when I will be glorified, and I will be glorified by my death on the cross. And not only will I be glorified, but my death is like me being a seed planted into the ground and dying. Now, Many of you are into farming or gardening, and you have an understanding of what it means to plant a seed. Now, specifically a seed of wheat or a, a seed of corn, you could use that particular kernel of corn or that particular seed of wheat to eat it and gain nourishment. But, 
if you plant that seed, that seed will die, but it will produce a plant that will eventually start off as a blade and then become an ear, and then you develop a full corn in the ear where you have numerous kernels of corn or numerous seeds of wheat that are in the likeness of the seed that was planted. If you plant a, a, a seed of corn, you don't get an apple tree. You get a corn plant. And Jesus is saying, unless I die, much fruit will not be brought forth. And so Jesus is saying, my death will bring forth much fruit. That fruit will be in the likeness of the seed that was planted. That fruit will bear a harvest. And that harvest will be in the likeness of the seed that was planted. In other words, Jesus' death on the cross will produce people that are like Jesus as he dies on the cross. Amen. There is much power in the cross. This harvest that Jesus alludes to in John chapter 12 is described in Revelation chapter 14 where we read in verse 14, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. That's Jesus again. He was glorified on the cross, but he's coming back someday to harvest the fruit that is a result of his death on the cross. One like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And verse 16 says, He that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. You know, James chapter 5 says, in verse 7, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. And we read the first part of the verse, and we're like, you know, I'm just being patient, waiting for Jesus to come. Someday Jesus is going to come again. And as we talked about this morning, it's going to bring an end to all of my sorrow and suffering. But, you know, the Bible actually paints a different picture. Yes, we're waiting for Jesus, but really He's waiting for us. Amen. Verse 7 says, Behold the husband, and that's Jesus, the one who's coming with a sharp sickle, waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. So Jesus who is the farmer, is actually waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. The seed was planted when Jesus died on the cross, and he's waiting for that seed to germinate and to come up from the ground and to mature so that eventually he will have a harvest where he can thrust in his sickle and gather the grain that he intended, intended to mature when he died on the cross. And he has long patience for it. Did you realize Jesus is waiting for us? Yes. He's waiting for the harvest of grain that is to be in the likeness of him when he died on the cross. You see, Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20, describes the harvest of the righteous and then of the wicked. The righteous are the harvest of wheat, the wicked are the harvest of grapes. But the harvest of wheat, the righteous, they are produced in an interesting sequence here. Actually, Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, describe the 144,000 who are like Jesus in character. In their mouth is found no guile, just like Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 20 through 22, where it says, When he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. We see that he was an example, that we should follow his steps. The 144,000 are just like that. It says that they are without fault before the throne of God. Hebrews 9.14 says that Jesus presented himself without spot. But the word in the Greek for spot is the same word as fault in Revelation 14. Jesus presented himself without fault. The 144,000 are found without fault before the throne of God. 
So the 144,000 are like Jesus. We see them in Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, and then Revelation 14, verses 6 through 12, tell us that the 144,000 are produced by the preaching of the three angels' messages. And when the three angels' messages produce the 144,000, then we have a harvest. Now, verse 13 of Revelation 14 tells us that there will be those who die in the preaching of the third angel's message who will participate in the special resurrection. But the great harvest at the end of the world is a result of the three angels' messages producing a harvest known as the 144,000 who are the much fruit that Jesus described when he said, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And it brings forth much fruit by the outpouring of the early rain and then the latter rain. Now, what is it about the three angels' messages that produce the harvest? And how does this bring closure for Jesus. You know, there's a lot we could say. I'll mention in passing that the first angel's message has the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. You do realize that the three angels' messages are not just for North American Adventists. Just so. It's to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And if you go out and see the rest of the world, you're gonna you will realize just how large of a task that God has set before his feet is. And if you're not even preaching the message where you are, what are we doing? But that everlasting gospel, the gospel that never changed, is described in Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, and this point is often missed by almost all of Christianity and probably most of Seventh-day Adventists. But if you turn to Romans 1, 16 and 17, which describes the everlasting gospel, Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. That word power is the Greek word dunamis, which is similar to dynamite, meaning that the gospel has explosive dynamite power to blow up your sin-polluted heart. And it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. And that word for believe is the Greek word that is the same as faith. So for everyone who has faith, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Meaning that it is for everybody. Now, what is so powerful about this gospel? That it's like dynamite. You believe in this gospel and it's like dynamite. Well, if you go to verse 17, notice what verse 17 says. For therein, in the gospel, not, it's, it's not some theory, but it's in the gospel, is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Now, you know what most Christianity teaches? They say that in the gospel, the righteousness of God is declared. And they say that the book of Romans proves that the gospel is only a legal transaction that gives you forgiveness but doesn't change your life. And that's not what Paul is teaching in the book of Romans. In the book of Romans, he says that the everlasting gospel has dynamite power to change your life because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed in the lives of those who have faith. That's power. Amen. The power is that the righteousness of God is not simply declared by God's people, but it's demonstrated. Yes, right. Right. And then it goes on to say, from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And I don't know why it says several have written to me inquiring if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I've answered it, it is the third angel's message in verity. And we mostly stop right there and say, see, justification by faith is the third angel's message. It's a legal transaction. And then she goes on to say, she quotes Revelation 18.1. And by the way, this is Review, Review and Herald, April 1, 1890. She then quotes Revelation 18.1. She says, the prophet then declares... 
And she quotes Revelation 18, 1, After these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And then she goes on to say, Brightness, glory, and power are to be connected with the third angel's message, and, will, and conviction will follow whenever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. So in other words, justification by faith is connected to the righteousness of God being revealed, which is connected to the loud cry of Revelation 18, where an angel comes down from heaven, having great power, Power, and the world sees the righteousness of God. Yes, right? Where the earth is lightened with the glory of God's character. And the re one of the reasons why Jesus hasn't come back yet is because many Seventh-day Adventists believe that justification by faith gives them license to keep sinning. Mm -hmm. And yet the reality is justification by faith properly experienced leads to the righteousness of God being revealed in your life. And let me just tell you something. If you have sin in your life, the righteousness of God is not being revealed. Right. Plain and simple. Christ comes in, sin goes out. Sin comes in, Christ goes out. Amen. So what is it about the three angels' messages that produces the 144,000 and the harvest? Let's keep going. Early writings, page 254, the third angel closes his message thus. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By the way, some people are in the third angel's message after verse 11. That's not right. Verse 12 is part of the third angel's message. As he repeated these words, he pointed to the heavenly sanctuary. The minds of all who embrace this message are directed to the most holy place where Jesus stands before the ark, making his final intercession for all those for whom mercy still lingers and for those who have ignorant, ignorantly broken the law of God. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. And then you, hopefully you'll see this. John chapter 12, verses 23 and 24. Jesus is saying, my death on the cross is the seed that produces the harvest. Revelation 14 shows us that the three angels' messages produce the harvest by producing the 144,000 who are like Jesus. So can we show from the Bible that the third angel's message is a description of Jesus' death on the cross so that it produces a harvest that is just like Jesus? Do you get the question? Mm -hmm. Can we show that the third angel's message of Revelation 14, 12 is a description of Jesus on the cross so that it will produce a harvest of wheat known as the 144,000 who are like Jesus in character. And I'm going to show you today that absolutely we can do that. And this to me is an absolutely mind-blowing, powerful study. Go back to Revelation 14, 12. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And we've heard this verse many, many times. And we think that we kind of know what this is talking about. But let me show you these three elements. Patience, obedience, and and the faith of Jesus, and how each one of these elements is connected to Jesus dying on the cross, and how that will produce a harvest in the same kind. Go to Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Very familiar verse, wherefore saying we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with what? Patience. That's the same word as Revelation 14, 12 in the Greek, not just the English. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now we get to verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now listen to this. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. That word endured in the Greek is the same word as patience, but in English we don't say that he patienced the cross. But it's the same word in the Greek as here is the patience of the saints. 
Jesus endured the cross, we are to run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. That's why some of the modern translations say, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. If you're going to run a marathon, you don't do a 100-yard sprint. You do an, a, a race of endurance. And we're called to run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us in the way that Jesus endured the cross or demonstrated patience on the cross. Now you might say, okay, Jesus endured the cross. Let me tell you something. You think you can endure the cross, you need to come up to a higher plane because this is Jesus on the cross. He's hanging on the cross. Well, he's, he's gone through Gethsemane already and then he goes through this mock trial where they blindfold him and they're hitting him and they're spitting upon him and they're saying, prophesy, who smote you? And you know what most of you would do? You would be kind of like trying to be a good Christian until a certain point, and finally that line is crossed, and then you've and then you've been through that. Now you're hanging on the cross, and they're saying, "If you be the King of Israel, come down from the cross, and then we will believe in you." And you're the one that created those people who were saying that. And finally, a line is crossed, and you're like, "That's it. I'm going to put you in your place, and I'm going to show you who I am." and you don't believe me, then how come you can't even hold your tongue with your spouse? Jesus endured the cross. Here is the patience of the saints. When Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints, it goes far beyond learning how to be calm and composed when things aren't going so well today. That's part of it. You know, in fact, Ellen White says in the book Great Controversy, 621, the season of distress and anguish before us will require a faith that can endure weariness, delay, and hunger, a faith that will not faint, though severely tried. Now listen, I can be patient when I've had a good night's sleep, <laughs> when I have food in my stomach and the meals are on time, yes. and when things are running on schedule. <laughs> now, if you can't even be patient, then may the Lord have mercy. <laughs> but I can say in my own human effort, apart from the power of God, which is, that's not what we want, but even apart from the power of God, I can be patient. When I've had a good night's sleep, when the food tastes good and it's coming on time, and when clinic, for me, for me, my thing will be, are the patients coming through at a proper rate so that I'm not running behind? My stress level will go up if I'm running behind and I've got a lot to do still. And you can apply that to any other scenario in your life. Oh, I'm patient because today, I got eight hours of sleep, I had good devotions, and have food, and my clinic's running on time, and the patients are actually reasonable to talk to today. <laughs> I don't have the ones today that are like not listening to my questions and telling me things that have nothing to do with what they're here for. But they don't know that they think they need to tell me this, but they don't need to tell me this, that kind of thing. <laughs> so as long as they're good, Hey, how are you doing? <laughs> but what are you like when you get a short night's sleep? Oh, the Lord understands. I'm just going to have a bad temper today. And I didn't even get a, a meal on time, so surely the Lord's going to understand now. And everything's spiraling out of control. Nothing's running on time. Of course the Lord's going to understand that I'm snappy and irritable and unpleasant to be around today. Surely the Lord understands that. Now listen, friends, this is just the starting point. That's just like a routine day. You're not hanging on the cross. And when Revelation 14, 12 says, here is the patience of the saints, or here is the endurance of the saints, here are the group of people who learned to look at Jesus on the cross as he endured the cross and said, because I'm looking at Jesus, I will respond the way Jesus did when he was hanging on the cross. The 144,000 is not just like, oh yeah, I learned to be patient. I'm at least 
polite now, when I, even when I'm frustrated. Well, that's a good start. Pray by the grace of God. We all need grace in that area. But this goes even beyond that. It talks about a faith that will not faint, though severely tried. And if you keep reading on in Hebrews 12, starting in verse 3, it says, For consider him. Yes. That endured, there's that word again, that endured, such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your mind, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And sometimes we use the sinners that we have to deal with. Maybe it's someone in church who's promoting apostasy. I mean, I've been in a church where people were promoting adultery in the church and all of these kinds of foolishness that comes in. And we use that as an excuse to say, oh, well, because of apostasy, I'm going to show them. But consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, unless you get tired of dealing with it. We have this line that once it gets crossed, we say that's it. And scripture says you have not yet resisted unto blood, meaning death, striving against sin. So learn to look to Jesus and endure the way He endured. Amen. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who learned to look unto Jesus as the author and finisher of their faith so that no matter what temptation or trial comes our way, we immediately look at Jesus hanging on the cross and we gain strength and help from Him. Amen. We're not comparing ourselves among ourselves and saying, well, you know, even the pastor or the hell elder, they'll lose their temper sometimes at board meetings, so I guess I can too. That's not going to cut it in the judgment. The Lord's going to say, did you look unto Jesus? Right. Here is the patience of the saints. Can you see how the seed that Jesus planted when He died on the cross is designed to produce a harvest yes. of the same likeness. Yes. You know, Hebrews 5, 7 says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Being made perfect, he became the author unto eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And that segues into our next point. Not only are the 144,000 described as having patience or endurance, it says, here are they that keep the commandments of God. You know, in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 through 7, Jesus is described by the Apostle Paul, and he's actually quoting from a Messianic prophecy in Psalms 40. And in Hebrews 10, verse 5, it says, Wherefore, when he cometh unto the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me, and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. So in other words, a body was prepared for Jesus to be a sacrifice on the cross. Then in verse 7 it says, Then said I, Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now we see that that will in Gethsemane was to go to Calvary. Now, not only that, Psalms 40 gives us a clearer picture of what the will of God is. Because remember, we're seeing how Jesus on the cross is personified in the third angel's message of Revelation 14, 12. We're going to start in Psalms 40, verse 6. Sacrifice and offering that is not desired. Mine ears hast thou opened. Burnt offering and sin offering hast thou not required. Now notice verses 7 and 8. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written to me, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. So the will of God is God's law in our heart. And Jesus says, I delight to do your will, O my God. You know, I've met too many Seventh-day Adventists who try to make a profession of keeping the commandments, but it's kind of like, ugh obedience. Isn't it legalism anyway? Well, oh, this is just, oh. Well, you know, I don't want to obey, but I kind of have to, I guess. Jesus delighted to obey his Father. And when you love the Lord, Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
and it's not with gritted teeth. I mean, me and my wife, it's like, okay, I love you, but man. So you, are you sure that I can't look at other women? Ugh. <laughs> Frustrating. What's this all about? Man, I can't have... Man. Okay. Come on, that's not love. And we think it's okay to treat God that way? So, Jesus said, the body that was prepared for me was to do your will, my God. And I delight to do your will. Your law is within my heart. And as he's hanging on the cross as a perfect sacrifice, he is the perfect demonstration of perfect obedience as the lamb without blemish. He could hang on the cross as the perfect lamb because he's perfectly obedient and a body was prepared for him to be perfectly obedient. So he's hanging on the cross of, as a demonstration of what it means to keep the commandments of God and to delight in doing so. Amen. And so when you look at the 144,000, they have the patience of the saints, meaning they learn to endure the way Jesus endured the cross. And just as Jesus delighted to do the will of God, which is God's law in his heart, which means he kept the commandments of God, the 144,000 in the same way have kept the law of God because interestingly Hebrews 10 talks about how Jesus did God's will and Psalms 40 shows that that's God's law in our heart and mind well the new covenant in Hebrews 10 16 and 17 says God says I will write my law into your heart and mind so Jesus lived a new covenant life and so people try to say that the law of God was done away with on the cross when in reality Jesus is a demonstration of the new covenant life where you have a delight to keep the law of God and he's going to produce a group of people which he writes his law into our hearts and minds as the mediator of a better covenant, as our high priest. So from the most holy place, he's working to write his law into our hearts and minds so that he will have a group of people which keep the commandments of God. And the group of people in Revelation 14, 12 who keep the commandments of God will delight to keep God's law the way Jesus did. Yes. And that's not legalism. No. Amen. If you find it a chore to obey, it's probably because you haven't given your heart to God. And you need a heart conversion experience. So Revelation 14, 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And then the last element, and the faith of Jesus. I'm going to read to you a couple of statements from Desire of Ages. This is starting on page 753. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. So as Jesus is hanging on the cross, humanly speaking, he doesn't see a way out. His senses tell him this is the end. Christ felt the anguish, <clears throat> Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute <clears throat> that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. So now Jesus has to contend with something that every single one of us contends with. Feeling. What you feel and what you can see by sight versus what God has promised. Now, Jesus has the promises from the Father, and he knows Scripture from ahead of time, that he is going to come forth from the grave as a conqueror. He even told the disciples before his death on the cross, meet me in Galilee. He said that before he died. But when he's hanging on the cross... He's not feeling that. 
And a lot of times we get into circumstances in life where we come to church and we hear the word and maybe we even get up and preach the word or teach the lesson and we say what the Bible says and we say what the spirit of prophecy says, but we get into a circumstance in life and we look at every circumstance and scenario that we are facing in that trial and we don't see deliverance. And we're forced to confront living by feeling or living by faith. Now let me tell you something. Those trials are good for us because they are helping us to learn how to exercise faith when we can't see a way out. Amen. And Jesus didn't see a way out. It's not like he's hanging out on the cross like, okay, this, this hurts, this hurts. Mm. But eventually, pretty soon I'm going to go to sleep and then I'm going to come forth from the grave as a conqueror and it's going to all be good. That's, a, you know, that's not what he's feeling. He's on the cross and the devil is tormenting him saying, Jesus, you've gone too far. You have second death sin on you and that's too offensive for your father. He didn't want to tell you because he loved those people so much so he wanted to save them so you're going to have to take one for the team, Jesus. It's, it's, it's too much. If those who drink the cup of the second death die eternally since you have, you're gone too, Jesus. That's what Satan's saying to him. Satan's trying to get him to come off the cross. And that's what Jesus is feeling. And too many times we just go by what we feel and what we see and we don't go back to the Word of God and claim the promises. Three pages later, Ellen White says in Desire of Ages, page 756, Suddenly the gloom lifted from the cross and in clear trumpet-like tones that seemed to resound throughout creation, Jesus cried, It is finished. So he's speaking differently than what he had felt. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. A light encircled the cross and the face of the Savior shone with a glory like the sun. He then bowed his head upon the breast and died. Amid the awful darkness, apparently forsaken of God, Christ had drained the last dregs in the cup of human woe. Now listen to this. In those hours, he had relied upon the evidence of his Father's acceptance heretofore given him. So listen, he doesn't feel the Father's acceptance on the cross. So by faith, he relies on what he knew from before. When the trial came, by faith, he relied on what he knew from before. He was acquainted with the character of his Father. He understood his justice, his mercy, and his great love. By faith, listen, by faith, he rested in him whom it had ever been his joy to obey. And as in submission, he committed himself to God. The sense of the loss of his Father's favor was, drawn, was withdrawn. By faith, Christ was victor. Amen. So as he exercises faith... That feeling of despair leaves and he overcomes. Amen. And a lot of times we're not exercising faith. We just feel this helplessness and we turn into like the children of Israel in the wilderness where we don't see manna, we don't see water, and we're like, oh, I guess God let us out here to die in the wilderness. Thanks a lot, God. I've been a faithful servant of the Adamus for how many years now? And I've been doing your work and you let this happen to me. Thanks a lot, God. That's what the children of Israel did. And then we say, oh man, I can't believe them. They, they went through the Red Sea and then they started complaining. Oh yeah, how many things do you, if you just sat down and, and looked back at your life, at how many times God has clearly blessed in your life and you're still complaining? <laughs> now listen, Jesus demonstrates faith on the cross. Interestingly, he says to the Laodicean church, as he's standing at the door knocking, he's saying, let me come in. And the reality is for Laodicean Adventism, Jesus is inside, he's outside. We talk about him, but we don't let him in. He's like, if you let me come in, then in verse 21 he says, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame. So Jesus is saying to Laodicea, you can overcome as I overcame. So there's something for those who say we can't overcome sin. That's the message that Jesus gives to Laodicea. 
But 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 shows us how we overcome. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So Jesus overcame. We are to overcome as he overcame. And we overcome by faith. And the cross demonstrates overcoming by the faith of Jesus. Amen. That's the message to the Laodicean church. So, get this. Revelation 14, 12, maybe you never saw this before, is actually a description of Jesus on the cross. Here is the patience of the saints. In other words, here are those who endured the way Jesus endured the cross. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Here are those who are obedient and delight to do the will of God the way Jesus was on this earth and the way he demonstrated a perfect life of obedience while hanging on the cross. And here are they that have the faith of Jesus. In other words, here is a group of people who exercise faith the way Jesus did as he's dying on the cross and he senses that his father has withdrawn his favor, but he relies on the evidence that his father is with him based on promises from before. And the 144,000 sense that God has withdrawn from them, but they claim God's promises from what they've known about God from before, and by faith they are victorious. Amen. Listen, Revelation 14, 12 doesn't just like, oh, here's some nice people. Yeah, they have some patience. Yeah, they profess to keep the commands of God. They come to church on Sabbath. And they have some faith. It's so much deeper than that, friends. These are people that are the fruits of of Jesus' death on the cross. Jesus is the seed. He's planted a seed that will bear much fruit, John 12, 24. That fruit is going to produce a harvest. That harvest is going to look like the seed that was planted. The seed that was planted is Jesus on the cross. And that demonstration of the harvest is Revelation 14, 12, where you have a group of people who have the patience of the saints, who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus in the same way Jesus demonstrated on the cross. Now, this has been admittedly theoretical so far, but with a little bit of practical application. I'm going to close by making it very practical. Okay? Christ's Object Lessons, page 67. But before I say that, let me say this. The reason why the third angel's message has power is because it is a demonstration of Jesus on the cross. That's why it has power. Christ's Object Lessons, page 67. The wheat develops first the blade, then the ear, after that the full corn in the ear. The object of the husbandman and the sowing of the seed and the culture of the growing plant is the production of grain. He desires bread for the, hungry, for the hungry and seed for future harvests. So the divine husbandman, that's Jesus, looks for a harvest as the reward of his labor and sacrifice. Listen, Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men. Amen. Now I've heard people say, oh yeah, it's a reflection like the way the moon reflects the sun. Now listen, I'm sorry, let me just break this down. Basic English. Reflection and reproduction are not the same words, okay? So when Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men, it's not a faint reflection the way the moon reflects the sun. It's a reproduction of himself. Christ is seeking to reproduce himself in the hearts of men. And he does this through those who believe in him. Now listen. The object of the Christian life is fruit bearing. Did you hear that? Yes. The object of the Christian life is fruit bearing. It's not to live a comfortable life. Amen. The reproduction of, so continuing on, so the object of the Christian life is fruit bearing, the reproduction of Christ's character in the believer that it may be reproduced in others. So sometimes we're like, well, if I can just overcome, I need to overcome, I need to overcome, so I can be like Jesus. No. The life of Jesus is reproduced in you so that you can then go out and win others to Jesus so that they will be like him too. Amen. The purpose of evangelism is not simply to win 
baptisms to people who believe a message but who are unchanged in heart and life. It's to win people who will be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. Now, she goes on, next page, the fruit of the Spirit, because the object of the Christian life is fruit-bearing, and that fruit-bearing is to be like Jesus in character. Continuing, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. She's quoting Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And she says, this fruit can never perish, but it will produce after its kind a harvest unto eternal life. So if you want to know what the fruit is like, go to Galatians 5. Then, this is the familiar part. We usually skip the parts that I just read. This is the familiar part. When the fruit is brought forth, immediately he put it in the sickle. That means a lot of rain has been poured out. Because the harvest has come. Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. This is how Jesus brings closure, by reproducing his character in himself. That's seen in Revelation 14, 12. And then, let's listen as she keeps speaking. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then she concludes by saying, we're all who profess his name. Listen, this is applying to me and to you. We're all who profess his name, bearing fruit to his glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel, quickly the last great harvest would be ripened, and Christ would come to gather the precious grain. Now this is an indictment on Seventh-day Adventists. For all who profess His name, bearing fruit to His glory, how quickly the whole world would be sown with the seed of the gospel. You know why people aren't one to the, to the message that we have? It's because of us. Now, what are the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And then the next verse, by the way, which is important, says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. So that's part of being crucified with Christ. You're crucified with Christ, fruits of the Spirit are seen in your life. This is where it gets very practical. Do you really have love in your heart? Listen. Loving your parents and your children does not mean that you are a Christian. Atheists love their children. Atheists take care of their own. Atheists make sure that their kids have something after they're gone. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have love. Now, don't, that doesn't mean go out and treat them badly. Obviously not. But the Bible says, love your enemies. Bless them which persecute you. Do good to them which despitefully use you. Christian love is the love of God towards everyone, including the people who are your enemies. Yes. And treating them in a Christ-like way. And so people look at Seventh-day Adventists and they're like, man, those people know how to fight. I mean, I'm not an Adventist, but I go onto Facebook and I see all these different Facebook groups, and you have Facebook groups about the truth about this talk, the truth about this, true Adventists this, and then you look at the comments of Adventists who are debating these topics, and man, I, I have gotten away from these debates. Yeah. Um, I've been called a Jesuit and all sorts of stuff, so whatever, but you just see this satanic spirit that takes over these Adventists on Facebook as they fight over truth. And it's like, oh yeah, we have the fruit of the Spirit. We love each other so much that we call each other names. Love. Joy. Now, I hate to say this, but there's a reason why this term has been coined. But there are a lot of Adventists. And I've even seen some people that it makes you wonder if they think it's a sin to smile. <laughs> you go to church and it's like, we've got to be reverent. Long face. Long. It's like we have this righteous disposition. I just, I really, 
we have no joy in our hearts, and the Lord sends blessings into our lives, and we're just pilgrims and strangers bearing through this life, and it's it's a struggle, but somehow, some way, and the fruit of the Spirit is joy. Amen. If you have Jesus in your life, you have everything. Amen. And you want to share that with everyone around you. You have we are not supposed to be a downcast, dejected people. And by the way, I'll just throw this as, as a side point, and I need to wrap this up, but when it says that we're pilgrims and strangers on the earth, that's not a call to be strained. Amen. Just take that for what that's worth. <laughs> Love, joy, peace. Now, I might add, I've heard some of the strangest ideas I've ever heard from some of them. Yes, sir. Weird, awful, wacko ideas from some of the Adventists. Yes, you don't be like that. Amen. Just stick with what the Bible says. The spirit of prophecy. And don't come with some weird, testing truth that was never known to man until you discovered it. Love, joy, peace. You know... The Bible talks about a peace that passes all understanding. Great peace that have they which love thy law, nothing shall offend them. When you are following the Lord, you will have a peace in your heart. Amen. That's a fruit of the Spirit. Long suffering, that's patience. We've talked about that. I don't need to spend a whole lot more time on that. Gentleness. Fruit of the Spirit. You know, I'm sorry, but uh, being a bull in a china shop is not a virtue. Now, there's a time to speak up and to stand for what's right, though the heavens fall, but um, not with a scorched earth policy approach. You know what I'm talking about. A take no prisoners attitude. You're either with me or against me, and I'm going to take you out if you're not on my side. Fruit of the Spirit is gentleness, goodness, faith. We've talked about this meekness, temperance. That's why we have the health message. But we also get plenty of rest. And we're temperate in all areas of our life. We're meek. We're not going around, you know, puffing up ourselves to say, do you see how good I am? Those fruits, if they are all seen in our lives, are an evidence that the Holy Spirit has touched our lives. And we are like the wise virgins of Matthew 25 who have that extra oil that when the crisis comes unexpectedly at the end of the world, we are prepared to meet the crisis because we have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. And there is no crisis too great that through the power of God we can't meet because the Holy Spirit is in our heart and we are ready to go forth and meet the crisis. And the truth is, is that when we have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, people will be attracted to us and they will want what we have. And then when a lot of rain is poured out, they will even be drawn to us in a more significant fashion. But listen, friends, if you're going around and people being turned off by the, by the way you share truth with them, don't just assume that, oh, I shared the truth and it was too hard to handle. Maybe go back and look at your method and make sure that you're not turning people away by a harshness in your presentation. I mean, I've seen it happen. I was sitting at a potluck one time when I was in California, and there was a young man who was a medical student. He was actually a Jew, and he was in Loma Linda. He'd been accepted, and he was coming to our group, which was a, a solid Adventist group, and he came to our potluck, and there was an individual at potluck that day who started just really peppering him with questions that were inappropriate in tone. Like, so uh, when are you going to just accept this Adventist message? Why are you not accepting it? When's going to be your first Sabbath at church where you're like, I am in this fine? You know, why are you delaying? What's taking you so long? Why? What's going on? And I mean, the questions were inappropriate. And it turned the guy off, and guess what? He never came back. The way we live will either attract people so that they will want to be part of what we profess, or... They will want to have nothing to do with us. On the flip side, I know some 
Adventist people close to where I live that have so much joy and peace and love in their home that, I mean, my family, we look forward to the time that we get to spend with them because it's like a taste of heaven on earth. Amen. And that's the way our homes should be. Amen. There should be love, joy, peace, patience gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance, all of these things, in a very practical way, that is how Jesus is going to bring closure. The seed that Jesus planted in the ground when he died on the cross was a demonstration of him dying on the cross and of a perfect character that demonstrated all of the fruits of the Spirit, patience, obedience, and faith and the harvest that Jesus will harvest that will be ripened by the outpouring of the latter rain will be a demonstration of the way Jesus was as he was hanging on the cross. Amen. And so a day is coming when God is going to look down from heaven when this world will be brought to an end of sin and suffering and the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit will look on from the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary and they will quietly say, and the universe will be looking on, they will say, here they are. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And God will have flipped the arguments of the devil in the great controversy on its head where the devil was a perfect being in a perfect environment and said, God, we can't keep your law. We were made perfect. But we can't follow what you say. And God's going to take a generation of saints from the weakest generation that have ever lived and through the power of God, he is going to produce in them a demonstration of the way Jesus was on the cross and he's going to say at that point, what do you have to say, Satan? And the outlooking universe will say, just and true are your ways, O Lord God Almighty. We have no further questions. Case closed. And the question I have for you today, whose side are you on? Are you allowing Jesus to come into your life on a day-by-day -day basis? So that through you, he will bring an end to the great controversy. It's not your glory or your power or your strength that the great controversy will be brought to a close. It's through the power of God. It's through God working through his saints. But there must be a submission and a, will, a willingness to yield to Jesus. And that is what's going to bring closure for Jesus. Friends, God has given us a high calling. It's an amazing calling to think that the 144,000 who have the patience of the saints, keep the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus are like Jesus in character, especially as he's hanging on the cross. And I'm well aware of Ellen White's statement that says the closer we come to Christ, the more imperfect we will appear in our own eyes. But what that means is we know what we're like apart from Jesus, and as we keep our eyes on Jesus, we don't realize we've been transformed into his image, but the people around us will see the change. And we will be made into the likeness of his image. And that is God's purpose for each one of us. Listen, God didn't bring you into this earth as a Seventh-day Adventist to just be another Christian, another Adventist, who would come and go and live an ordinary life. God brought you onto this planet to be extraordinary. Amen. To be a demonstration of the power of God, of the righteousness of God that will be revealed, that will be seen throughout the earth. That is why we are here. And when God has a people who have patience the way Jesus endured the cross, who obey the way Jesus did, and who have faith as Jesus did, as he couldn't see through the portals of the tomb, then Jesus is going to come down from heaven and take us home. But as long as we keep making excuses and say, well, the pastor said it's okay, and I, I haven't heard any pastor say it in a while where I'm at, but we blame this on the pastor or the elder or this church or that magazine or whatever, as long as we keep making excuses, the pain of God will continue and God will keep looking for a people who can be his harvest. But the reality is, and I believe that it's coming someday very soon, that God will have his harvest. And what I see happening in God's church today is an evidence 
that Jesus is coming soon and He is going to have a people that are ready to meet Him in glory. So I want to make an appeal as we bring this to a close. You've heard the message from this morning and then again this one. Maybe you're convicted that, wow, I grew bringing pain to the heart of God and I don't want to do that anymore. But I need help. I don't have the power to do it. Maybe you're under conviction, wow, I need to be fruit that is in the likeness of the seed that was planted when Jesus died on the cross. And I don't have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, or meekness, or temperance in my heart. I have bitterness, resentment, anger. I won't look at the person in church that is on the other side of the issues, and I'll be all warm and loving and kind and fuzzy to the people on my side and give them a hug and show the love of Jesus in my life. And two seconds later, when the other person from the other side comes out, I'm doing this thing. And so I'm not really having the love of Jesus in my heart, and I don't have joy. I, I, I'm always unsettled because of all of these feelings that I have and I'm not temperate and I'm not demonstrating faith and I collapse under trial and I need the grace of God in my life. Now I realize this isn't an appeal for everybody, but listen, this camp meeting isn't just to have a warm, fuzzy feeling where it's like, wasn't that a nice message? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we just go back and keep doing whatever. Some of you are here today because the Lord brought you here because there's something in your life that is keeping you from being ready for Jesus to come. And you are under conviction and you have heard these messages. And now you're starting to think, oh no, well if I go forward, what are people going to think of me? Let me tell you something right now. Did you realize that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God? And it's not a revelation to any of us that we've all struggled with sin, okay? And in church, we are here to show support to those who respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And this is not an appeal for everyone, but I'm going to make an appeal now. I'm going to ask for people to come forward now. You are under conviction that there is something in your life that Jesus needs to work on, that you need to surrender to Him so that Jesus can come. And we're not talking about people who are out there promoting evolution or the LGBT movement. We're talking about us who believe in the three angels' messages. But there are still sins in our lives that are keeping Jesus from having closure. And I would invite you to come down to the front. And those of us who come forward, we're going to, have kneel, we're going to kneel and have a special prayer. But we want to surrender everything. There may be a struggle we're going through. And we are saying, Lord, forgive me. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your promises. And this camp meeting is going to change my life by the power of God. I'm going home, and I'm going to make some changes. Maybe I've been spending five minutes in devotions, ten minutes. I'm going to start spending a thoughtful hour with the Lord because I love Him. And I'm going to be surrendering things that He reveals to me, and I'm going to stop making excuses. And even if everybody else at church is doing it, I know what the Lord has revealed to me, and I'm going to be faithful to what the Lord reveals to you. And the Lord will pour out His blessing. Amen? Amen. I'm going to kneel with you now as, as we pray. Father in heaven, You are a good God. You are far better to us than we ever deserve. Your mercies are new every morning. We don't deserve them, but You still give them. Every day is a new day that we can choose to give our lives to you. But Lord, forgive us for taking so long. Lord, I pray that today is going to be a new day moving forward. That this high Sabbath will not be a, a passing moment of good feeling, but that it will be a change a clear change, a repentance that we turn in a different direction. And by the grace of God, we come to an understanding that our sin has brought pain to the heart of God. But that your promises are such that we can be more than conquerors through your grace and power. And that we can overcome as Jesus overcame. Lord, I pray that we would learn to spend that thoughtful hour that we would learn to meditate 
on the promises of God. And Lord, I pray that when the trials of life come, rather than collapsing under the weight of the trial, we would exercise faith so that that faith would be tested and tried when the final crisis comes. May we learn to hang on to Jesus and to look in his wonderful face each and every day of our lives going forward. Give us grace to sustain us and strengthen us. And help us to realize if we do stumble or fall that your grace is sufficient and that you will be ready to bring us right back into the fold. But may we be more than conquerors. And may we be faithful when Jesus comes, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.